we are so glad that you are here with us this morning. If you are a visitor, we would especially like to welcome you here today and ask you to fill out a Visitor Connect card that is located in the back of your pew and please drop it in the offering box as you exit the sanctuary this morning. Thank you for joining us. We will be having a baptism service on Sunday morning, May the 9th, which is also Mother's Day. If you would like to be baptized, please see Brother Nate for more information. Also, ladies, you should have received a Connect card from Miss Margarita this morning or last week. If you can please fill those out and you can return those back to her so that we ladies can stay connected. Ladies will be having a paint party on Monday, May 24. Please go ahead and mark your calendar for this fun event and more information will be forthcoming. Are you ready to serve? Please fill out a form that's located in the foyer on the table and you may complete it and place it in the offering box located at the back of our sanctuary. Please join us again here Wednesday night at 6.30. We would love to have you here for adult Bible study in the main sanctuary, B Kids, as well as BSM. Thank you. If you've not joined us on Flock Note for church announcements, please do so by texting Bethel LH to 84576. And finally this morning for your ways to give, if you are in service with us today, you can make tithes and offerings donations located at the back of our sanctuary, or you can donate through our Tidely app or our church website. And please see your information update page for more announcements. Now everyone, let's stand this morning and get ready to worship. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Are you glad to be in the house of God this morning? Amen. Yeah, let's go. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Let's give him a hand of praise this morning. We came with expectation in our hearts this morning as I was on the way to church. God was dealing with me in my spirit. Just what, what are you bringing to church today? What are you bringing to church? You know, some of us, we brought our families. Some of us, we brought stuff. Sometimes we bring burdens. Sometimes we bring change. Sometimes we just bring happiness and joy. And sometimes we bring expectation. But this morning, what are you bringing? And God says, bring it to me and I'll take it. I want your offering. I want your heart offering. I want your mind offering. I want your body offering. I want your spirit offering. I want everything about you. And that's where Jesus is at today. He's calling out to us this morning. He's saying, I want you. I need you this morning. Bring it to me. So this morning, let's lift our hands across the building. Let's get our hearts and our minds on him because he is worthy. Amen. He is worthy this morning. Let's give him all of our, our attention this morning. Father, we love you. We are not on this platform for us, God. We are on this platform for you. We come this morning into this building, into this house, Lord, to lift your name on high. We come this morning, Father, solely to bring our offerings to you in every way, God. We give you our heart, our mind, our spirit, our soul. We give it all to you today, God. We love you. We praise you and we adore you. Lord, you are lifted up in this place this morning. You are lifted up right here at Bethel, Lord. This is the house of God, and we love you this morning so much. Give him a hand of praise this morning, church. Worship with us.
mercy is as new as every rising of the sun. And your love and kindness, your love and kindness, better than life. Your grace is all sufficient, it's an all sufficient grace. Your power and your glory are forever on display. And your love and kindness, your love and kindness, better than life. This next song will preach itself. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word, just to rest on his promises, and just to know, thus saith the Lord. Hallelujah.
the faith to believe that he can save us instantaneously he also can move in our lives in the same manner so please pray for these requests this morning these families pray for comfort grace mercy healing this morning and love lord father we're so thankful god to be gathered here this morning Lord, we know that there are some that do not have the same privilege that we have today to be able to come to your house to worship you today, Lord Father. Lord, we thank you for your mercy, your grace, God, your goodness. God, you've been so good to us. Lord, in spite of circumstances, Lord, that we need to maybe take our eyes off of, you are good to us. And Lord, if we look just closely enough, we can see your hand in every situation in our life. If we take our eyes off our circumstances and put them on you, we can see your hand of mercy, grace, and love. And God, this morning we come to you for requests for salvation. God, we know that without salvation, nothing else truly matters. And Lord, we pray for those that do not have a relationship with you, that do not know you, they would know you. 
And God, we pray for healing for those that are sick, those that are not feeling well, those that have diagnosis. God, those that need your healing touch in their life, we pray in Jesus' name that you would strengthen them as we are gathering and praying this morning for them. God, we also pray for comfort. Lord, we pray for your your love to just wrap arms around families that are going through such difficult, unbearable times at this moment. God, those that have lost loved ones just recently. Lord, Father, we just pray that you comfort them. God, that you be that peace to them that's unexplainable. We pray that you just overshadow their grief with love and compassion. And God, may we do our part to bring them comfort in this time as well. God, for every need that was called out this morning, God, every need that was spoken, we pray in Jesus' name that you move in a mighty way in that life, in that family, home, heart, that circumstance, in Jesus' name. God, we know all good things come from you. And Lord, we know that your ways are just. But we pray for extended grace this morning to trust you even in our deepest, darkest times with our deepest, darkest needs. We pray for more grace to trust you completely, putting everything we have in the palms of your hands. And Lord, this morning we ask all of these needs to be met in Jesus' name. Amen. Well done, well done, my good and faithful. 
Hallelujah. Amen. Can you imagine that day when you hear Jesus say, well done, my good and faithful one. Amen. If you will right now, if you will stand across the building, I'm going to ask you to walk across the aisles and shake two or three people's hand this morning. Welcome them to Bethel Assembly of God. It's great to have you this morning. Amen. Hey guys, Brother Nate's back. It's great to see you. I hope you've had a great week. I hope you have been blessed. It's been awesome being back in God's house with you today. So today we want to be real quick. We want to talk about day three. We have talked about day one where God created the heavens and the earth and light. And then on day two, God created the sky. That's right. And it separated the waters. And then so now we catch up in verse nine of Genesis chapter one. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let dry ground appear. And that's exactly what happened. God called the dry ground land. He called the water that was gathered together the seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce plants and let them produce their own seeds and let there be trees on the land that grow fruit with seeds in it. Let each kind of plant or tree have its own kind of seeds. And that's exactly what happened. So the land produced plants. Each kind of plant had its own kind of seeds and the land produced trees that grew fruit. And God saw that it was good. And that's so awesome. You know, God spoke things into existence and that's exactly how they happened on day three. You, we've got the water there and God has already separated the waters by the sky on day two. So on day three, we've got water here and you know what happened? Boom, land shows up because God said, let there be land and, and then trees and then fruit and then the seeds on them and it's so awesome. And God looked at all this stuff and God didn't say, you know, I think I should tweak this a little bit. I think I should change the way this goes down. No, God looked at it and said, this is good. God created you the same way and we're getting there. But right now I want you to understand that God says something, it happens exactly like he says it and it is good. So glad talking to you today. Let's have a lot of fun at B. B Kids this morning. Let's be excited. Let's be ready to go. Adults, great work from Pastor Jack coming. Great to see you today. Well, we're so very thankful to have you with us this morning. First of all, I need to thank Brother Chuck for uh, filling in for us last week. Will you give him a hand this morning? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Brother Chuck. I taught him most everything he knows, not, but we're so thankful for him being here this morning and uh, for last week as, as well. Title of the message this morning is, have you ever wondered what happens to you when you die? What happens when you die? Okay, if you have your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, now the Bible doesn't tell a whole lot about this, but this does tell. Luke chapter 16, Luke chapter 16 Luke 16 and verses 19, if you have your Bibles. Luke 16, 19 through 25. Begin to reading like this. There was a certain rich man. By the way, this is not a parable. I believe this to be an actual event with actual people, real people that lived and died. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen. In other words, he, he had the best of the best. He fared sumptuously every day. He had something good to eat every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, left over or scraps. Moreover, dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip 
the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, remember that in life, in the lifetime, receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides this, between us is a great, uh, between us and you is there a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that they may testify unto them, lest they come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Father, we thank you for this precious and holy word. We ask, sir, that your Holy Spirit, which is already at work in this house, begin to speak to hearts and to lives. And God, that you will move upon us this day. God, I ask, first of all, that you save in this house. God, that you lift up and encourage. Father, I pray that you heal bodies and heal spirits and heal emotions, God. God, that you heal families, Lord, this morning. God, that you pour out your spirit. God, that you fill them up and run them over with the Holy Ghost, sir. In the name of Jesus. And everyone ask, amen. Let me, let me say again this morning, this word, let me remind you, this word is inspired, it's infallible, it's inerrant, it is eternal, never going to go away. What happens when you die? Well, I want you to know, first of all, it's heavenly. Can I have an amen? The Bible teaches that to be absent from this body, if you're a believer, is to be present with the Lord. Case closed, basically, on that. You're going to a good place. Can I have an amen? You're going to be... You're going to be, okay, you may not have been done, you may not have done jumping jacks in a while. <laughs> you may not have hopscots or anything like that, but you probably will on that day, amen. Well, what happens when you die? Now, don't you love it when somebody says, what happens when, when, you, when this is this? And somebody says, well, that depends. <laughs> don't you love it when somebody says that? Well, let me tell you, what happens when you die? It all depends. What happens after death has all to do with what happens before death. What happens before, what happens in death, after death, is altogether what takes place before you die. First of all, God created man with the intention or the plan of him never, ever dying. God intended man never to die, period. And to live forever. God didn't intend for man to live a hundred years or a thousand years, or ten thousand years, or a hundred thousand years. God intended for mankind, this body, to live, to be, to live forever. Now, can you, let me tell you something. Had sin not come into this world, Adam could be sitting right here today in perfect health and no arthritis. <laughs> and no hurting bones or fingers. Now, I thought about this afterwards. Can you imagine living a thousand years or more or whatever, and you go to your bank and you say, I need a 30-year mortgage? And said, don't worry about it. I, I got that covered. I can, I'll be here. <laughs> I'm going to be here. So, can you sure you can go? Th yes, I'm going to be here for the 30-year mortgage. You got in, God intended you to live forever. I want you to know that your spirit, your soul, will live forever in spite of what happened to this body. Because when Adam sinned, it didn't change. It, it, it changed some internal places, but it, it, it's the body that affected at least some of it. Now... Adam in the Garden of Eden and what happened there forever changed humanity and the world. When Adam willfully disobeyed God, he sinned concerning the tree of knowledge of good and evil and ate the fruit. He, listen, it ain't that he didn't know. He willfully, on purpose, ate. I want you to know right there on the spot, Adam died. Boom. Boom. Immediate. No, he didn't fall dead. But something in his heart shrank. There was a spirit inside of him that was alive, and it immediately died right there. It died. Those of us who were born in the likeness of Adam, which is every one of us, because we're all heir to Adam, 
were born with a dead spirit like Adam received after he sinned. Because now we have all inherited that deadness or that sin. You may not have done that particular sin, but you're guilty of that sin. Now, his body, Adam, lived on for many, many, many more years, and then he died. But it was hundreds of years, and then he died. Now, I want to listen to this very carefully, but I'll try to go slow on this. I am a spirit. I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. Let me say that again. I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. Man is a triune being. Body, soul, and spirit. This is what he consists of right here. Our body, which is physical. This is what you see right here. This is, this is what people think of as you. I want you to know this is not you. This is the body that you live in. We have a soul. That soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. This, is, this makes up our soul. We are a spirit. Now, this is the deepest part of your being right here. The deepest part of your being. This is what some people call the God part. This is the part that is either alive or it's dead. This is the part that the Holy Spirit comes in and quickens, as the Bible says, and makes alive. And this is the part where the Holy Spirit comes in when you're baptized in the Holy Ghost. This is the part. Now, if not, if you're not born again, then you are still dead in trespasses and sins. What does that mean, Brother Jack? Is that we believe that you must be born again. And if you're not born again, that part of your spirit is can still dead. Listen to what John 3 says. That which is born of the flesh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's pretty simple, really. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, ye must be born again. Your spirit that's inside of you, the deepest part of you, the most important part of you must be born again. It must come alive. It can only come alive by the spirit of Jesus Christ. Now listen, I hope I don't want to confuse you on this, but you, you must be baptized in Jesus. Now I'm not, I'm not one this or anything like that. Don't misunderstand me. But, this, but Jesus must come into your heart. Can I have an amen? Without that, you are lost. But when Jesus comes in your heart, you are changed. Can I have an amen? How many has been changed when the Spirit of God, when Jesus came into you? I mean, turn your life around. Wow. It was, it was a wow moment. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says this. Now when the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord. Now listen to this. When Jesus is on the cross, he's hanging there. He's about to die. He doesn't say to, to the Lord, I commit my body unto you, Lord. He doesn't say that. He says, into your hands I commit my spirit. I commit my spirit unto you. When a person dies, a lot of things happen. A lot of things happen to the Bible, into the body. Listen, you might be buried at sea. You might be lost. You might be horribly disfigured. By some accident, you might even have a body to be found. But the body is to be honored. Um, don't, you don't have to worry about it, what's happened to you because Jesus knows where every atom of you are. Atomic particle I'm talking about. He knows where you are. Listen to this. This is Daniel 12 and 2 says, Many of those, those bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame. And just as it appointed for man once to die, then after that the judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting him. Once again, the Bible teaches to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. That's if you're a believer. And if you're not a believer, you're going to be in the place where the rich man went. Now I'll get on to that in just, just a little bit. Okay, all believers and all everybody, period, have, you see, when you die, there are some people who teach you have a soul sleep. This is incorrect. You do, your soul does not sleep. Your soul is forever awake, ever conscious. 
There is no such thing as soul sleep. I'm going to prove it to you right here in this moment. This is not, and when you die, this is not your final reward. Paul, who was caught up in the presence of the Lord, said he heard inexpressible things that a person is not allowed to communicate. For we know that this, our earthly house, this tent is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desire to be clothed. We shall not be found naked. We are confident, yes, rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul also said he's pressed between two things. I have a desire to depart which is in Christ, which is far better. He wanted to go be with Jesus, but he wanted to stay with his people more. That's when, when you see someone struggling for that, he's says, listen, I know the best thing for me is if I go to heaven. We groan when somebody dies. We just, you know, it tears our heart out. But if they're in Christ, they're in a much better place than they are if they stay here. Can I have an amen? Listen, we are, if they're, in, if they're in Christ, we ought to be thanking God. We ought to be praising the Lord because they have passed from this life into where their eternal promise is going to take place. Give the Lord praise this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. It's not a, I want you to know, if you're in Jesus, it's not a bad thing to die. It's not a bad thing. Now, personally, I don't have that plan. You may have your own plan. I was working on a church some time back, and they said, listen, if you're a member of this church, you get a free burial plot. I said, I don't want to be there. <laughs> I don't want to be a member then. <laughs> I'm not looking to go that way. Can I have an amen? I'm looking to go by what's called the rapture when Jesus Christ comes back. I believe he could come back today. Can I have an amen? All right. Listen to this. Stephen the martyr being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens open, the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God and they stoned Stephen as he was calling upon God saying, Lord Jesus, receive my, not my body, receive my spirit. Your spirit's an important thing, people. Your spirit's an important thing. It's very important. Now let's get on over here. Now Jesus, remember, he's on the cross. It was just a few weeks, weeks ago we had the Easter. Jesus is on the cross, you remember this. And on the one side of him is this thief, but he's repented of his sins. Jesus doesn't care what you've been, he cares what you're going to be. He doesn't care about your past. You're going to have an Amen. Let me say that again. He's not caring about your past. He's only caring about your future. This thief is on his side over here. And another insurrectionist over here. And the, the thief says, remember me when you come into uh, your, your kingdom. Jesus turns to him and says, today, not next week, not whatever. He says, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Do you know what happened? He was there. In just a few hours, when he passed from this life, he is in the arms of Jesus in paradise. Can I have an amen? All right. Now, as I already read to you in Luke 16 and 19, the rich man's body was dead. His spirit was alive. The rich man had his right mind. The rich man knew where he was. He was in hell. He knew Abraham. Way, oh, there's this a gulf. We don't know understand how this is. Now, this is fixed, but there's a space in between here that one can't pass from the other side. There's no boat, there's no plane, it's too far from you to jump or whatever. But there is a gulf here. He knew Abraham, but he couldn't get to him. He could feel pain, but he couldn't escape it. He could see with his own two eyes. He had full consciousness. It's, it's not like you go out and like I'm, I don't know anything. No, you know something. He could feel pain. He could see. He could think. He could reason. He could reason. He knew Lazarus. You know, we wonder about this. Do they think about what's going on on earth or can they see it? I don't, he didn't say he could see it, but he could think about it. He thought about his family while he's in this terrible place. He is thinking about his family while he's down here. And he's wanting to send somebody to get them saved so they won't have to come to this place. He prayed for mercy. 
He asked, he said, be, Father Abraham, be merciful to me. Send him, Abraham, put, Abraham dip his finger in water and let it drop one drop on my tongue. I wonder, did Lazarus ever ask for mercy when he was laid at the rich man's gate? And I wonder if he ever gave him. By the way, we think that Lazarus worked for this man, helped produce his crops, which made him rich in the first place. And then instead of helping Lazarus, he just sort of kicked him out. Now that he had made his wealth, didn't need, any, didn't, you know, didn't need anybody else. I want you to be careful climbing the ladder up. Don't step on anybody because that's people. And by the way, he heard it lonely at the top. Are you crazy? It takes people to get to the top. You better bring somebody with you. You better take somebody with you. You don't just go by yourself. You take somebody with you. You surround yourself with your friends, your loved ones, your people that help you, and then you help them back. You love those people. You love those people. By the way, he, this rich man, he also prayed while he was in this place. His prayers went unanswered. His prayer, listen, this is something, of all the things I've just told you, this, this makes me the most curious about the rich man called Abraham father. He called Abraham father. Father Abraham. He recognized him as his spiritual patriarch. But he didn't live like Abraham had taught him to live. He didn't live like God had taught him to live. He, and Abraham, look at this, as if that wasn't something, listen to this. Abraham returns and calls him son. Remember, in thy lifetime, you received good things, and likewise, Lazarus, bad things. He calls him son. And what happened to the rich man when he died? Now, this is just Jack, okay? Uh, uh, this is just Jack. I can see a great funeral procession, something like a great statesman. Would have. I can see a beautiful casket, flowers, hundreds of people gathered around in a church or synagogue somewhere, and a large marble monument set there, and the preacher gets up there and says something like this, this was a wonderful man who is now at peace with his Lord. Not. Not really. Not really. And you know something that something this this ominous that is not said, at Lazarus doesn't say a single word. In the commentary here, Lazarus does not open his mouth. Not a single time does Lazarus say anything. He didn't say, I told you so. He didn't say you got what you deserved. Never do that, people. He didn't say anything. It's sometimes, you know what? It's better if we just turn to your neighbor. Bite your tongue. It's sometimes it's better that we simply don't say. Sometimes the most spiritual thing that you can say in all your life when people is running you up one side and down the other is just simply to bite your tongue. You can have an amen, husbands. Can I have a guard going out? <laughs> Lazarus had a meager funeral. The Bible says angels carried Lazarus to paradise. You wonder how you get there? You don't worry about it. You've heard all this thing. Follow the light. You see, you've certainly seen this on television. Follow the light. Follow the light. Let me see. I'm looking for a spiritual word I can use right here behind the pulpit. <laughs> Nothing of that, people. Nothing of that. When you die, you won't have to worry about getting there. you got a taxi waiting, honey. The chariots of angels carried uh, uh, Elijah. Thank you, brother. That's why I keep you around. <laughs> carried Elijah onto heaven. I don't know if you're going to have a chariot, but it says angels. I think I'd rather have angels. They're going to carry you to be in the presence of the Lord. And you're going to be there forever and ever and ever. Now, there's some other things that happen, but you're going to be with the Lord, so it doesn't matter. Can I have an Amen. You'll be out of this place. Now, it doesn't say, I'm going to assume this. Angels also had to escort the rich man to his place. 
Now listen, I want you to know it's not over yet. Now listen, I've got you in the paradise. I've got the rich man in a bad place. I want you to know God's not finished yet. God is not finished yet. I've got you all now separated. Now there is a, the good, there's a paradise and then there's torment down below the, below the ground. By the way, we also, listen, hell is beneath us. You know, wonder why we spend so much money going to, up to heaven. We've spent billions and trillions of dollars on space shuttles trying to get up. We don't ever spend much money going down. <laughs> By the way, Russians have drilled the deepest hole. Over, I forgot where it's at, but they've drilled, drilled the deepest hole. It's not very big, about eight inches deep. And they've drilled, try, they're just trying to beat us, beat the Americans into doing something greater than them. But anyway, anyway, okay. It's Ephesians 8, 4 and 8 reads all this. Wherefore he, this is Jesus, when he ascended, when Jesus ascended on high, he led captivity, this is paradise, and where... Um, Abraham's that. He led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. Now he that is ascended, he, now he that ascendeth, but what is it? He first also descendeth first into the lower parts of the earth. This is going down. If I know my geography, this is down, the lower parts of the earth. And he that descendeth is the same also that ascendeth far above heavens that he might fulfill all things. Now listen. When Jesus came out of the grave on what we call Easter Sunday, what it doesn't tell you then and what it doesn't show is, as he came up out of the grave, he was in there with Abraham. You know, I'm pretty close to this. He went and rescued Abraham and those Old Testament saints that had been in the bosom of Abraham and lifted them up. Can I have an amen, Brother Chuck? Okay, all right. Whew. Rescued those people out of, of that place. Listen, they, were, they weren't tormented. They were in a good place. But there was a better place coming. And he lifted them up and took them all to be in glory. Every single one of the Old Testament saints. Now listen, these Old Testament saints believed on and they didn't understand somehow. They didn't know how it was going to work because Christ hasn't been crucified yet. But they believed forward. They believed what they believed what the prophet said that somehow it's going to work. Just like we believe it happened already and we've seen it and it worked. Our part's easier than the Old Testament's. Because we've seen it hurt. We have the, we have the record of all how it worked. And he got it. So Jesus, after the resurrection, came out of the grave. What we couldn't see is Abraham, where he took, where he, where he gathered Abraham and all those who were in paradise and took them up to glory. The Old Testament saints, and they're right there, right now. By the way, it also says that many of the Old Testament saints were seen walking the streets of Jerusalem. Now, wouldn't that mess you up? You're walking there, and you're going to get some water there at Jacob's well, and like... There's Jacob right there. There's, that would mess you up, people. That was, so he's supposed to be dead, but he looks he looks spry. He looks healthy. He looks he looks wonderful. I want you to know when Jesus comes and gets you, you're going to look wonder. You're going to look better than you ever looked. Now let me. Tell, this is, I have to. Be, this is Brother Forbes. So I, he's not here right now. He's done on been on the glory. Somebody was asking him. You know, years ago. Um, our fellowship sort of frowned on people, especially on women, doing a lot of things. Hair, all kind of stuff. Makeup, all this kind of stuff. And they asked, him, asked Brother Ford one time, he said, Brother Ford, what do you think about this makeup thing? Some of you younger people don't know what I'm talking about. And Brother Ford said, well, I'll tell you. Even an old barn looks better with a little paint. That may be why, you know, he's gone on to glory already. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't say that. I did not say that. Brother Forbes said it. Brother Forbes, you said that. Told me about it. <laughs> and there they're going to be till the rapture. Well, listen, the rapture is going to take place. Behold, I show you a mystery. It's mysterious. It's a sort of, 
You know, um, let me tell you something. You know, fishing is mysterious. It's mysterious. You throw a line down there where you can't see, hoping to catch something that you can't see. And after a while, you feel something that you can't see. You hook it up and bring it up into fruition where you can see. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed. That was over a, uh, a nursery room one time in the back. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed. Okay, move on. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump has nothing to do with the president. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. That's us, people. Now, we always hear about this at funerals. I want you to know it ain't just for funerals. It's for the here and the now and the where we are at. It's to give you hope that this is not over. This is not the end of it right here. We shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. There's nobody that hurts and it breaks up everywhere and it, and it does all this kind of thing and your heart's out of rhythm and it's all this kind of stuff. It's going to be changed, people. I'll tell this story that I'll tell so over time that just fits in right now and some of you had not heard it and the rest of you who've heard it laugh like you thought you heard it the first time. I was probably about 20-ish. I'm in church, probably not paying much attention, Brother Chuck. We had this evangelist. I'm sitting, I'm sitting in the back. I'm trying to be not there, but there. This preacher comes up and tells about what I'm telling you today. And he says, just think. When the rapture takes place, it's going to be just like you're 35. I'm sitting there about 20. And I said, you false prophet. You false prophet, you. Here I am, 20. Why would I want to be over the hill at 35? Are you crazy, man? Is something wrong with you? Where did you get your theology at? And now if I could run that preacher down, I said, man, you know how right you were, but I want you to know it's not going to be like you're 35. It's going to be better than being 35 because you're not going to feel like whatever any of that is. Can I have an Amen. It's not going to be 35. It's going to be much better than 35. We got any 35-year-olds in here now? I was 35. When... <laughs> Come right up here to the altar, brother. Come right here. I was 35 when I came here. I was 35 when I came here, and I thought, oh, have mercy, I was just a child. Not knowing nothing, still don't know anything. For when this corruption had put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought the past the saying which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Whoa. Oh, death. This is what he's saying. Oh, death. He's talking to death. Hey, death, you think you've got me? You think you have me? I want you to know, death, you ain't got nothing because when the trumpet sounds, I got you. <laughs> I got you. When Jesus came, I want you to know, he triumphed over death and he just, listen, Brother Rick, I think it was Brother Rick said this the other day. Listen, Jesus laid his body, laid his spirit down and his body down and he picked it back up himself. He didn't have to have anybody else do it. He'd done it himself. He, it's like he laid down to sleep and I'm going to wake up in three days and nobody's going to help me. I'm going to, I, I laid down and, okay, I want you to know something. They did not murder him. I know, and I will, I'll say that later on, but essentially he, just, he laid his spirit he, he gave up the spirit. He gave up the ghost. They didn't take it from him as in most cases. Oh, grave, where is thy sting? Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be, God, thanks be to God, which gives us up the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me stop right here for a moment. You see, most people think like this. Oh, I don't feel good today. Oh, oh, my bones is killing me. Oh, my hurt, my back, and my knees, and all this. And I've got the, I've got a mortgage to do coming through. Say, I don't have the victory. I ain't got nothing to do with your victory. How you feel has nothing to do with your victory. You got the victory one day right here at an old-fashioned altar. 
When you ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart, to be born again, this is where you got the victory. Your emotions have nothing to do with that. Your feelings have nothing to do with it. It's your faith that has everything to do with how you got the victory and you keep the victory through Jesus Christ and his shed blood. As long as you trust in God, you're going to have the victory and today he either calls you or comes to get you and you're going to have it until then. Can I have an amen? Nothing's going to separate you from the love of God. You keep your arms in Jesus. Keep holding on to the cross and he'll prove himself faithful every single time every day in your life. Can I have an amen this morning? Give God praise. Hallelujah. 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 Who died for us that we may, that whether we wake or we sleep, we should live with him or be together with him. Doesn't matter. I'm alive. I'm in Christ. I'm in dead. I'm in Christ. I'm the same thing almost. Can I have an amen? I want you to know we worry about all the, these this is Now, this particular verse I'm going to give you, now this is from heaven's point of view up here now. And he opened the fifth seal. Listen to this. And this is John. He said, I saw the altar of the souls who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony they had. In other words, they were martyrs. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Now they're, they're saying, God, what they did to us is wrong and you know it. And how long is it going to be before you do something about it? We, we do the same thing. We pray and say, God, just how long is it going to be before you do this? I want to see them swatted right now. Jesus, come on. Come on. Tell the truth. You know it is. You're not supposed to, but how long is it going to be? And a white robe was given to each one of them. You're going to get a white robe. You may not like white, but you're going to learn to love it. You're going, and, they the, and they should rest a little while longer. Let me tell you something. Just rest a little while longer. God hears your prayers. He's going to answer it in his time. In his time. Not my time, not your time. He's not going to be late. And they should rest a little while until the number of their fellow servants and their comrades who should be killed was completed. See, God comfort them. They're at peace. They're at peace. They, hey, they have questions. You know, sometimes we hear, you hear this, place, you're not supposed to question God. You know, you've heard that before, haven't you? I don't want to know where somebody, where's that in the Bible? Now, I don't mean you should complain all, but it, it, it's normal for me to ask questions about, God, I don't understand this. He that lacketh wisdom, what are you supposed to do? If you lack wisdom, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to ask, and he will give it to you. So that's nonsense not to say you're not supposed to question. It's nonsense. Ask God. He'll give you the answer. Can I have an amen? What happens to you when you die? It all depends on what you do before you die. It all depends on what you do before you die. It depends on if you're living for Jesus. And it depends on if you're born again. God's Spirit must come inside of you. Into that deepest, innermost part of you. I was witnessing to this young man. Well, no, he wasn't. He was older than I am, I guess. I was witnessing to this man. And I was telling my, my, I had a good friend that pastor right down where I was witnessing from, to this man at, right down the road, good, good pastor friend of mine. And I was asking to him, I said, I said, are you saved? He said, the preacher told me I was saved. Oh, Jesus, how much, can, let me tell you something. When you get saved, you can tell the preacher, I have done met the master. He came into my heart. You, you won't have, someone won't have to tell you you're saved. You'll tell them, I'm saved because I had a witness. My, my spirit came alive. I was, listen, I was changed. I was changed. When I got saved, I got changed. Can I have it in Anybody else with me? I got changed. What I was normally, what I was thinking about, I stopped thinking about that. I started thinking about heavenly things. I started thinking about what does God want me to do, not what I can do. What does God want me to do? What happened when you died? It all depends on what you do. Before you head bowed, eyes closed all across the building this morning, church.